We're in week two of this series called Disagreeing Without Being Disagreeable. Um, and if you're wondering why we're doing that, you're just not paying attention to culture. <laughs> Our culture, nation, nationwide, even in church, we don't know how to have a disagreement without being disagreeable. I mean, our attitudes get triggered. <clears throat> People offend us. We offend others. And I, here's the premise of this. Disagreements are unavoidable. You are going to say something intentionally or unintentionally that, that is going to disagree with someone and maybe even offensive. But being disagreeable how we respond and how we engage with people, our attitudes and our words, they don't have to be disagreeable. Being disagreeable is avoidable. And so that, that's what we're talking through. <clears throat> we're gonna be in the scriptures here today. Last week, we began with this question. What causes disagreements? And so we looked at the book of James and he just makes it really blunt. Uh, where do disagreements come from? What causes them? He's like, uh, it's you, <laughs> They come from inside you. When, when you have an unmet expectation, oh, I thought they should have done this. They said that they would do this. I thought they would treat me this way. I thought they would respect me more. And your needs go unmet. He, he says this, that's where all your quarreling and all your fighting comes from. So if, if you missed that, go back and watch that from last week. Here's the question we're gonna ask this week. When should we overlook an offense? And if we do overlook it, how do we actually get over it so it doesn't linger in our soul and actually poison our attitude towards, towards people? So the book of Proverbs is known as a wisdom literature or a book of wisdom. Let me frame this talk with maybe three words of wisdom as we get started. They're in your notes. Take a look at them right there. The first is this, Proverbs 19, 11. It says, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Now, it's interesting. The book of Proverbs describes three different people. Uh, they describe evil people, foolish people, and wise people. And the wise person in this is the one who has patience, and it's to their glory to overlook an offense. But here's what our culture says, and sometimes we experience this. It's actually to our glory to win an argument. Because when we win the argument, it means we're right, we're validated, we're vindicated, and we feel better when we win. But the scriptures actually disagree with us. It's not to our glory to win an argument or to be right. Here's what's funny. In marriage, oftentimes, you can be happy or you can be right, but most of the time, you can't be both. Come on. It says this, it, it's to your glory to overlook an offense. Now, the word glory usually describes God, right? Not in this passage. It describes you. When someone says something to you that offends you and you're like, mm, I'm just gonna let that go, it's actually to your glory. You know what that means? It's actually to your beauty, to your attractiveness. You want to be attractive? Who doesn't wanna be attractive? I mean, you will be attractive to people when you overlook an offense that was handed to them. Overlooking an offense makes you attractive. Now, how big a deal is it to be disagreeable? You've all heard Hatfields and McCoys, right? I mean, family feuds, two families feuding against each other. This is like the late 1800s. You know what's funny? Or no, it's not funny, it's terrible. They, they're not actually sure, out of all the studies on the Hatfield and McCoys, all the documentaries that they've done, they're not actually sure what started it. Uh, it's, it's one of the families was on the Confederate side, one was on the Union side, and, and so maybe they thought that was it. Most people believe it was this. Um, Randolph McCoy claimed that Floyd Hatfield stole one of his pigs. And for the next 20 plus years, the Hatfields and the McCoys killed each other. A dozen on each side were murdered over a feud that no one was really sure or couldn't really remember how it started. And it reminds me of this proverb right here, Proverbs 17, 14. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. Do you ever get in an argument at work or 
spouse or one of your kids. And it just, man, it just spun out of control so fast that you just, you were like, how did we get here? It could have been weeks that this argument is going on. And sometimes the terrible thing is we can't even remember how it started because both of us in the midst of this argument got triggered and we were no longer disagreeing. We were being disagreeable. One more wisdom thought for you from Proverbs uh, 17, 9 reads this way. Whoever, oh, by the way, the point about the Hatfields and McCoys, just in case you're taking notes, is I just think every war begins as a disagreement. You never know what, what, where it's going to come or how big it's going to get. The third is this, Proverbs 17, 9. Whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. So question, what's at stake when you're being disagreeable with people? And oftentimes when we're disagreeable with people, we talked about this last week, we go to others to confirm that they were actually being disagreeable to us so that we feel validated. Well, when we share that, what's at stake? Here's what's at stake, relationships. There's only two things that matter in life, God and people. That's it. And people are at stake. What's at stake in being disagreeable? Marriages are at stake. Relationships with, with, from parents to kids and kids to parents, aunts to uncles, I mean, siblings, your cousins. What's at stake is those friends you've had for 20 years. The relationships at stake. Um, I, I think this is interesting. What else is at stake is actually the mission that Jesus called you to. Do you know how we say it around here at Church on the Hill? The mission of our church is displaying the irresistibility of Jesus so that lives are transformed. You can't display the irresistibility of Jesus and be disagreeable. When we're disagreeable, we are not irresistible. The very fact that if we don't get this right and we don't push back on our culture and says, I know they're not gonna get it right outside these doors, but we're gonna get it right here which part of what you heard in the testimonies of those baptisms is that community was different. They supported me, loved me, encouraged me. They wrapped their arms around me. They prayed for me. They prayed with me. They prayed over me. It's a different kind of community. But I'll be honest with you. I mean, come on. Have you ever had a disagreement and that it turned disagreeable in a church? It happens. It happens all the time. But what we're, what's at stake at that is the very mission that Jesus called us to. So, I'm just saying all this to say it's really, really important, but we have options. When someone disagrees with us and maybe they're disagreeable, let me give you four options. They're in your notes. Take a look at it. You can be a confronter, but the problem with a confronter is a confronter attacks. Now, I realize there's a healthy way to confront something. I'll get to that in a minute. I'm using the word confronter. They just kind of, they go after it, and it's often under these, this context. is hurt people hurting people. I was wounded. Now I'm going to go on the offensive, and I'm going to attack and just make this spin more out of control. Now, a healthy way of confronting, I'll call this a dresser. That's not a piece of furniture. It's someone who addresses the problem. Addressers, though, they restore the relationship. Here's another option for you, option three, an overlooker, and this is what we're gonna talk about today. An overlooker absorbs. They absorb the offense. They absorb it in such a way that it doesn't actually poison their own soul. They're able to absorb it and go, let's just move on. I'm sure that they didn't mean that. There's a fourth group, though, and we're going to talk about this one, too, because they get confused. It's an avoider. And avoiders, they actually ignore. So there's two good options here. Ready? You can address the problem, or you can, um, you can overlook the problem. Those are your two good options. Next week, Pastor Josh, he's going to talk about how to address it. I'm not talking about any of that today. I just want to talk about this. How do you overlook an offense? How do you overlook the moment? How do you know when you should overlook the moment when someone becomes disagreeable with you? One of our problems is this. We don't know the difference between avoiding a problem and overlooking a problem. So let's clarify that. Here's what it is. Avoiders, they ignore the disagreement or the offense and they miss the opportunity for three things. Resolution, healing, and wisdom. What resolution is this? What you ignore, you can't fix. If you have this ongoing relationship with someone, 
And you're going to see them tomorrow and the next day and the next day. If you ignore an offense continuously and pretend like it never happened, it, nothing ever changes. But the reality, too, is this. It actually can go into your soul and poison you, make you bitter and angry. At the very least, it's going to do this. Whenever you're around them, you will feel awkward, maybe walking on eggshells because you don't know the next time they're going to say something offensive. You also miss the opportunity for healing, to ignore pain. And really, that's what happens when someone offends us is pain sits in us. Oh, they, that's how they see me? That's how they think about me? I can't believe that they would treat me that way. They don't value me more than that. Um, we miss the opportunity for our own souls to get healthy. And it's going to come out one way or another, right? It either comes out in an outward explosion or an inward implosion. And at that moment, we realize how broken we are. It also doesn't actually give us the wisdom we need. Do you realize this? Every time you have a fight, a quarrel, a disagreement, a moment where you're disagreeable or someone's disagreeable with you, it is an awesome opportunity to learn something. I know we don't see it that way. We would love to avoid it no matter what. But if you're a avoider and you ignore it, we don't actually get to grow from it. And maybe God wants to grow us to say, you're getting triggered by something. Whenever you get triggered, it's because you're sensitive to something in you. And maybe God wants to give you the wisdom so that he could put his finger on that and heal that hurt. Come on. So here's how overlooking is different than ignoring. Here it is. Overlookers, they absorb the disagreement or the offense and here's the key, with the same grace that they experienced from God. Man, when we just go, wow, I was wounded, I was hurt, I'm so mad, I'm so ticked, I can't believe that person would. God, how do you see me? And hitting that pause button to go, God, you've forgiven me for so much. And this isn't a talk today on forgiveness, but to be able to see ourselves in such a way. This is, man, God has absorbed so much. Jesus absorbed so much on the cross for me. Maybe on this moment, I could absorb this for them. Um, when you acknowledge the disagreement, you're not ignoring it, you're acknowledging it. There was something that was said there that wasn't right. It hurt. There, there's not just a disagreement, but there was something there that's disagreeable. And it, it hurt or it offended. And it becomes important to figure it out. Now, let's just say for a moment, that your wife meant to say these words. She meant to say, I miss you. I feel like we aren't getting enough time together and I really want to connect. But what if what she actually said was, I can't believe you're going out again. You are never here. Because you know the, all those emotions that I just expressed that with and that's how your wife talks, right? Just kidding. Here, here's the problem. If your wife, men actually said those words to you. I miss you. I feel like we aren't getting enough time together and I really want to connect. In your mind, guys, you would respond with, are you saying I'm about to get lucky? <laughs> See, she said something and you heard something else, right? This happens all the time. Overlooking is about this. It's about choosing something that is more important than hashing out the disagreement. I may choose to value the relationship over the disagreement. It doesn't mean you're always gonna do this, but hear me out through this. I'm not ignoring it. I'm acknowledging it, but I'm gonna overlook it. I might value the intention of their heart over the words that they chose. You might choose peace on the team as opposed to you being right about it or confronting the disagreement. Um, Quick question for you. Are you more of an avoider or more of a confronter? I mean, I gave you four options there, but where do you lean? Some of you, I know you feel like you have the spiritual gift of confrontation. God bless you. <laughs> we probably won't be friends. Um, but some of you are like, no, 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 I'm just way too kind. Like, I, I just don't want to ever. And you're an avoider. And you've ignored some things in your life. Um, the problem is that sometimes that becomes toxic for us. So let's ask this healthy question. Are you ready? When should you overlook an offense? I gave you two options, right? Really two good options in a disagreement. You can address it 
or you can overlook it. So the two ends of extremes are probably not healthy. So do you address it or do you overlook it? There's a great resource out there if you want to read this. Uh, great author, good guy, uh, Dr. Bill Graybill is his name, and he writes this book called Resolve Conflict God's Way. And there's portions of this message that I have um, <clears throat> uh, generously borrowed from him. Um, but it's a fantastic book if you want to get that and read on that and study more on that because you're like, oh, this is my issue. Um, here's the question. When do you overlook it? I'm going to tell you the Bible's answer for this right up front, and then we'll work our way through it. Um, the Bible's answer for this is this. Ready? It's in your notes. You're going to fill in the blank. Is. The Bible says that it depends. <laughs> Isn't that helpful? Like, well, let's just go home now. Like, perfect sense to me. Here's two verses for you. Uh, Proverbs 19, 11, a person's wisdom yields patience. It's to one's glory to overlook an offense. We read that earlier. Well, okay, so overlook the offense. Here's the problem, Matthew 18, 15. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, then you gotta take one or two others along with you. This is the confrontation. This is the, I'm addressing something in a healthy way. So which one do you do? And the observant person might go this, well, Matthew 18 is about someone who has sinned. But when someone disagrees with us and often they become disagreeable, don't you often go, yeah, they're sinning for sure against me. And we define their offense at us often as sin. So how do you, and let me just recommend not doing that. And just assuming the best, oh, they didn't mean to say that, or maybe I'm misconstruing what it is that they're saying or communicating to me. But how do you know which one to do? Let me give you three questions real quick. There's lots of questions you could ask. I'm just coming at this from wisdom, uh, some, some scriptures here. But question number one is this. Does this offense or does this disagreeableness cause you to feel differently about that person for more than a short period of time? Pause for a moment on that. Think about that. Here's what's funny as I'm talking about this. Every single one of you is thinking about a situation. Yeah, you're like, yeah, it was on the way to church today. <laughs> Welcome, glad you're here. I hope you do think about a situation. Because this is not generic. This is not like, hey, this is some theory. No, this is very practical of what the scriptures talk about. Does, so does this make you feel differently about that person for more than a short period of time? Will this actually alter your relationship, because when you see them, you now are defining who they are by what they said. Because we do that oftentimes. Someone says something, and instead of, a, hey, they probably intended good, or maybe you're like, no, they intended to harm me, they don't like me. We define that person now by what they said or did. Uh, am I going to have a future relationship with this person? Is this relationship something that I value, and do I want authenticity to be between us? Or, this is all kind of the question under this first heading is, is the offense more about something that triggered me? Is something that was, or was it really truly offensive? Because when we get offended or we get hurt, sometimes it's more about us than it is about them. Maybe ask this question. Am I actually trying to validate my feelings or my opinions? Do you just want to be right? And if they just disagree with you, and maybe they're a little disagreeable at the same time, it just doesn't validate you. And you really want that. By the way, I want to state this, man. If you're a student, maybe even, no, this goes for adults too. There's something incredibly powerful about being validated by your parents. And isn't that the struggle with teenagers? I mean, as parents, you look at them, you're like, no, 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 don't, 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 slow down, wait, wait, wait. And what really what they want to hear is, oh, I'm so proud of you, I love you, I want to validate you. The problem is, sometimes, depending on who your kid is, majority of their life is spent doing things you don't agree with, <laughs> or the behavior that you just can't validate. I just want to state that there's something powerful in you as a 60-year-old man, as a 40-year-old woman, that wants to be validated by your parents still. And you want to be validated by your boss and your coworkers. And it's funny, as you get older, you even want to be validated by your kids. And when that doesn't happen, something, it reveals something about you that maybe you need to examine. It's not about them. 
Second big question is this, does this incident or situation cause serious harm to you, others, or even the offender? Did something happen that you go, that can't continue? If it does, it's gonna leave a wake of destruction in their path. For that person to be healthy, for other people not to be harmed, we have to address this in a healthy way. If that's the case, then don't overlook it, but that's your second question. Here's a third question. What outcome do I want? At times, we address things, and we haven't actually asked this question. What do I want? What do I want to see happen in this relationship? What do I want to see happen for them? What do I want to see happen for me? As you start processing that and just asking the question, what do you want? By the way, it's a great question when someone addresses you. Hey, you know when you said this and you did this and like, listen to them, um, ask them this question. So what do you want? Or how could I help with that? And uh, I realize that question can come across bad sometimes if like it's attitude, like, all right, so what do you want? What do you want from me? <laughs> no, no, genuinely, like, where do you want to see this go? What, what's my part in this? I'm listening. What do you want the outcome to be? I think as you start processing that, it's going to become clear. Do I overlook this or do I address this? Um, so if you get clarity on that, and you're like, you know what? I'm going to let it go. I, I'm, I'm not going to address it with them. They didn't, I don't think that they meant ill will for me. And by the way, when you hear something come out of someone's mouth or behavior and you're like, wow, that was unusual for them. That's a great sign to just overlook it. If you're like, here we go again, another round of this, that might be a great sign to address it so that your relationship can actually be authentic, real, and healthy. So here's where I want to land this plane today. I want to land it on this. If you choose to overlook it, how do you actually let it go? Because sometimes it's hard to let it go. You know when you've had a disagreement and maybe it's with someone you care about and you value and all of a sudden um, the, the argument's over. But I don't, maybe you're not like me, maybe you are. I just assume people are like me, rational, logical, make you know, common sense. Like, don't you just run that argument over in your head again? About a thousand times? And here's what's crazy. Um, maybe it's just me that's crazy, okay? And just nod at me and make me feel better about myself right now, okay? Sometimes that argument, I just keep going over and over. And then once I'm done with the argument that's already occurred, I move on to the argument that hasn't even happened yet. I know the next thing they're gonna say is they're gonna say this, and this is how I'm gonna respond. And then they're gonna say this, and then I've created a whole scenario in my head that is not even based in reality. Okay, I can tell by your response, I'm the only one who does this. So let me move on. Go to Philippians chapter four. Philippians chapter four is this. How do you move from anxiety to peace? How do you move from a tense, nervous, anxious brokenness to a place where you experience God's presence and his peace? So there's five things in there that I'm gonna to point to. But here's what's interesting. The context of Philippians chapter four no one ever connects these verses together. Look up Philippians 4.2. This is the context that Paul writes Philippians 4.4. So two verses up, he writes, I plead with Eudia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. What is happening here? These are two of Paul's close friends. People who, they serve together in the church. They're contenders for the gospel. And they can't get along. They're having a disagreement. He doesn't go into all of it. Is how disagreeable were they? I mean, was their hair pulling in the parking lot? I don't know. Let's assume the best about them. But that's the context for where he writes this. Are you ready? This is about how to change your heart and make your heart pure and healthy. He says this, verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. I can see him looking at these two women. Here's where we need to start. Yudia, Syntyche, rejoice. Those of you that I'm writing to, to help them iron out their relationship, I want you to rejoice and I want you to help them rejoice. It, go, it goes on, let your gentleness be evident to all. 
The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to write these things down because there's no way you're going to remember them all. I want you to dig into these this week, particularly if you're having a disagreement. I'm going to give you five steps on how you actually let it go. Here's the first one. Choose joy. I want you to choose joy by remembering what you're grateful for. He says this, rejoice in the Lord always. Not sometimes, not when it's good, not when you feel like it, but always, I say it again, rejoice. Let's try it right now. You ready? No, we're not going to sing a song. You don't want me doing that on stage, okay? What do you have to be grateful for? What could you choose joy about because of what God has done in your life? Right now, what circumstances do you have to be grateful for? Write them down or just... If you're not a writer or downer person, uh, say it to yourself. What are you grateful for? What are you thankful for? What is the thing that God has done in your life? What could you say? You know what? These are the good things that are happening in my world right now. You got them? See? You can do it. You can actually choose joy. The second is this. Prepare for gentleness. He says this, let your gentleness be known. Um, the same way I described just a minute ago, um, that you run through the argument in your head and then you run through the future argument in your head. I didn't, I, I didn't say be gentle. I think what we should do is prepare for gentleness. See, when you're running that that play over in your head and you're running the argument over, even the argument that hasn't happened yet, you're preparing for war, right? Take the scenario you're thinking about this morning. And I want you to run this conversation through your head. What does gentleness look like? What would words of gentleness be? Because we practice this kind of conversation all the time. You know what I mean? You don't. Um, you know, when you get attitude and your head starts bobbing this way, maybe you never talk that way. You know what I'm talking about though. But, but do we practice gentleness? I dare you to try it right now. Write a phrase of gentleness. What could you say to that person that would be gentle? And then if you, if you get the words right, here's what's crazy. You actually have to get the attitude right and the tone right. Once you get the words down, go say it in a mirror. I really respect you. Doesn't cut it. You know, even though despite everything that's happened, I, I really deeply respect you. It's very different, isn't it? Let's prepare for gentleness. Um, let, let me give you the third one. Replace anxiety with presence, prayer, and peace. Look at halfway through verse 5. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, which means this, it doesn't even make sense. Peace in us that doesn't make sense because it's not based on our circumstances, it's based on God's presence within us, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God's presence. Have you ever been in the middle of an argument and someone walked up? Or you've been like walking down the street arguing and then someone like walked up or you're in the middle of arguing and the phone rings? How do you answer the phone? Hello? Oh, hey, how you doing? You've just been like, rah, 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 and I'll say, hey, how you doing? Why? Because of presence. Make note of this. God is present with you. He's present in that argument. He's present with that other person. And when you realize that there's a third person in the room, it changes how you talk. Because you're accountable not to that one person. You're accountable to God's presence being in the room. He hears you. Which is crazy because it really reminds me of this. Uh, you have a choice of how you respond. The second thing is just prayer. I know it's so obvious, but the question is, this, how, how, did you actually pray about it? Did you actually bring this, dis, this disagreement to God and say, God, what do you want me to do? How do you see it? How should I change this? What, what do you want from me? And then pause and listen. And then do the really tough thing about obeying whatever it is you think God wants you to do. And then the third is just, it's peace. Ask God for peace. 
peace with him, peace within, and peace between them. Did you ask for that? The fourth and final, the fourth thing, there's five things here. I want us to assume the best and dwell on the good. Here's how Paul writes about this. Finally, brothers, verse eight. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy. Here's what you do, ready? Think about them. <laughs> Just think about such things. When you, when you do that, you're actually assuming the best and dwelling on the good. There is a story we're telling ourselves about the person we're at odds with. They are, and we all, I mentioned this last week, we tell a story to ourselves about how we perceive them, but we judge ourselves by our good intentions. Would you just reverse that? Judge that person assuming that they had great intentions in place. Um, when someone says, I can't make it tonight, I'm really tired. The truth is this, what they said to you was, I can't make it tonight, I'm really tired. What they didn't say to you was, I'm not your friend. You bugged me. Or I don't value you, I don't wanna spend time with you. They didn't say that. They said they're tired, but sometimes when we get dissed or put on the back shelf by somebody else, how many of us tell a story about that person or about the relationship that is more negative than the truth and the reality of what really took place? You with me? Check the story you're telling yourself. I think our focus, um, you will find whatever it is you're looking for. Um, have you ever tried to buy a new car? And you're like, you know what? I just really want a Chevy Spark. Because mm. I, I want a car that kind of looks like a golf cart, you know? And the mileage, oh, it's so amazing. Like you could drive all the way to Morgan Hill and back. It's like incredible, Chevy Spark. Mm. Just want one of those. And all of a sudden you're driving around and you see them. You never noticed them before. But there's thousands upon thousands of Chevy Sparks, even though they're one of the worst selling cars in America. Uh, you see them all over the place now. Why? Because you've spent time looking at them and fixing your brain on them. So now you see them all over the place. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, maybe you don't want a Chevy Spark. You can fill in the analogy with your favorite car. When you focus on what? What, is it? what does it say? Whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. You're training your brain to find that. So when you have a disagreement where someone becomes disagreeable, you're looking for the good and the hope and the life that's there. But the problem is most of the time we just focus on the thing that is so bad. You can train yourself to find the good and the beautiful. Final thing, thought for you here is, once you do this, Paul would say this, go do the right thing in the right way for the right reason at the right time. The Bible calls this righteousness. <laughs> Big churchy word. It means righteousness just means this, do the right thing at the right way in the right season at the right time. Verse nine says this, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, here's what you do, ready? Go put it into practice. Just, just go do it which means this, we need to stop making excuses for our disagreeableness. You and me need to stop making excuses for our behavior. And I know I gave you so much information today to figure out when do you overlook something and if you do, how do you actually get over it? I know I unloaded on you a bunch of scriptures. I hope you wrote it down. I hope you'll take those notes home and you'll review them this week. And I hope you'll go to a community group and talk about your, your great fights that you've had this week. I mean, better yet, how you've become more agreeable, even in the midst of a disagreement. Let's bow our heads. I want you to pray about this for just a moment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say one of those, I'm going to say each of those five points, and I want you to just pause over this and just consider what God's inviting you to do, okay? Don't look around at anybody right now. Just close your eyes, bow your head, and just ask this question. Is God inviting you to choose joy? If that's it, what are you going to do? 
Walk out of here with a decision of what you're gonna, how you're gonna live this out. Maybe you need to prepare for gentleness. He's inviting you to focus on God's presence, prayer, and peace. Maybe your weakness is you always assume the worst and he's inviting you to assume the best and dwell on the good. Maybe you got clarity this morning and you're ready to do number five, do the right thing in the right way for the right reason at the right time. God, the value of your scriptures is not just truth, but it's us living out your truth. So God, would you open our eyes to see what you want us to see? But also, God, would you open our hearts that we might obey you? And when you take our chippiness that we have sometimes and chip it away, would you make us people, people of peace, people that are more agreeable and loving so that we might display the irresistibility of Jesus so their lives are transformed. And we pray this in his name. And everybody said...